Hi everyone, we're going to spend some time in God's Word together again. So if you have a Bible with you, uh, why don't you turn to the Psalms? We're going to look today, uh, a little bit later on, at Psalm 142. Psalm 142. So I'm going to read it, and then we're going to look today at how we learn to lament. We're going to use that psalm as like a worked example uh, to look at um, praying with laments. These are prayers which are full of uh, sorrow in the midst of suffering, but they help us to turn to God uh, in tough times. So here is uh, Psalm 142. It says at the top there, a masculine of David when he was in the cave, a prayer. I cry aloud to the Lord. I lift up my voice to the Lord for mercy. I pour out before him my complaint. Before him, I tell my trouble. When my spirit grows faint within me, it is you who watch over my way. In the path where I walk, people have hidden a snare for me. Look and see, there is no one at my right hand. No one is concerned for me. I have no refuge. No one cares for my life. I cry to you, Lord. I say, you are my refuge, my portion in the land of the living. Listen to my cry, for I am in desperate need. Rescue me from those who pursue me, for they are too strong for me. Set me free from my prison, that I may praise your name. Then the righteous will gather about me because of your goodness to me. So like I say, we are today going to spend a bit more time uh, looking at lament, uh, laments in the Bible. Uh, I mentioned it maybe a few weeks, maybe a month or so back uh, when looking at the subject of suffering and patience um, from James chapter 5. And I just wanted to take another opportunity to be before long um, to kind of open this subject up a little bit more. To be honest, it's something that I am still learning about myself. I don't feel very familiar um, with this type of prayer. Um, and I want to learn to put it into practice in my own life. Um, and so I'm just nudging us in that direction uh, this morning as a, a whole church. You know, there was a time when uh, our prayer meetings that have been online, when we've done them on YouTube, uh, whoever was leading that, that first part of the prayer meeting would uh, would end that section by by looking at the call, uh, looking at the camera together and saying, "Keep praying." Uh, as a bit of a reference, I suppose, to strictly uh, come dancing and an encouragement not to stop praying. Uh, but what if you have? Or what if you're in danger of stopping completely? What if your prayer life has been grinding to a halt? Uh, you're still believing God, still believing that God is good, that he is true, that he is uh, sovereign. But maybe for one reason or another, you're just not feeling it. Um, uh, perhaps you're not saying out loud, prayer is a waste of time. Um, but perhaps you have started to think it. So I suppose I have in mind mainly believers praying. Uh, but if you're watching this and you're not a believer, I hope to show you that you know, a life following Jesus, a life uh, built on God's word in the Bible, uh, is, is plausible. It doesn't lead us to have to kind of ignore um suffering. The, the Bible is un, unapologetic. It, it doesn't hide suffering away from us. It shows us how to live in all sorts of different situations and seasons and challenges. Um, so it's not about kind of trying to live in some kind of strange fairy tale. Uh, this is deeply practical and a spiritual life following Jesus is deeply real. The, this is the greatest um, experience of real reality, as it were, is following God uh, and, and believing in his word uh, and trusting him uh, for all things. So, uh, so just bear that in mind. Now, if your prayer life has been a little bit grinding, uh, my encouragement to you would be take a different tack, try a different tack. Now, there are lots of places in the Bible uh, that help us to pray and they kind of provide us with a, with a model or a pattern of how to pray. 
Uh, you might look at Luke chapter 11 and the Lord's Prayer um, and see there that Jesus taught his disciples to pray in this way, saying, Father, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, and so on. Uh, and so if we've paid attention to that particular biblical pattern of how to pray, that's what's in our mind. Father, we're affirming that this is uh, relational, it's intimate, uh, and it's focused on praising his name, hallowing his name. Uh, and so we're not like forgetting that or setting that aside. Uh, that's one way of praying. Another, you might be familiar with uh, Philippians chapter 4 and verse 4 onwards where Paul writes there, uh, rejoice in the Lord. I'll say it again, rejoice. He goes on to say, let your gentleness be evident to all and do not be anxious, but uh, in everything, in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And so you might have that in your mind as a model for prayer. I'm going to rejoice and I'm going to give thanks and then um, I'll bring my requests. I'll, I'll bring before the Lord uh, the things that I'm asking him uh, to do. Uh, so don't forget those things. Don't forget those models. Um, but here's another way of praying, and it's another way of praying when perhaps you don't quite feel like starting with thanksgiving. Uh, or maybe you're not quite feeling that deep intimacy. Um, change tack a little bit. Here's um, an illustration. I have a little sailing boat here. Uh, so imagine you're on a boat um, like this, and it doesn't have an engine, so it can't just... Uh, with a propeller, it can't just uh, point and shoot, as it were. It's dependent on the direction of the wind, hence the sails. Now, if that boat is going along a straight canal or channel, um, and the wind's in a favourable direction, it can just sail straight along. But if the wind is coming straight towards the boat, to be honest, what I might do later on in the week is try and create a video right now, uh, and overlay that on the top to try and kind of help you visualize this a little bit more clearly. But if along this straight channel, the wind is coming straight towards the boat in the same direction as that channel, then the boat can't just sail straight forward. It's got to go from side to side, a little bit in a zigzag pattern. Uh, and then the, the wind can feel the sails. Uh, now it gets to the, uh, the edge of the channel and obviously it has to turn. That is changing tack. It's tacking across in a different direction and then tacking along again. That's the way uh, to make progress if you're sailing in a boat. And by illustration, that's how we make progress in our prayer lives. There are times, there are seasons, there are moments uh, when we are full of thanks and praise and we go in that direction. There's no problem going in that direction. That's wonderful. There's no problem with the Lord's Prayer. That's wonderful. There's no problem with Philippians chapter 4. That's wonderful. The there's no problem with the boat. There's no problem with the wind, really. And there's no problem with the sails. The trouble is, you will, if you just keep going in that direction, bump into something. Uh, so learning to lament helps us to change tack. It might feel like going backwards for a moment, but then we can turn again and make more uh, progress. That's why uh, I feel it's important to, to really look at this whole uh, way of uh, praying. Lamenting helps us to pray in the middle of suffering and sorrow. And there are some great examples in the Bible of people doing it in the New Testament as well. Uh, so we know that Jesus used the Psalms to pray. Uh, I remember Cy and Hazel uh, some months ago now in a life group that could actually meet face to face, just kind of talking about the Psalms and saying, Psalms, we can treat them sometimes like they're just a side salad to the main dish. You've got a big meal and on the side you have this little bowl um, with a few salad leaves in it. And their encouragement uh, was, don't think of the Psalms as just like a little side dish. Uh, think of them as part of the main meal on the plate. I think that's how Jesus prayed. And we know that when Jesus was on the cross, you can read through the Gospels and you can see that Jesus prayed out psalms of lament from the cross. You know that he actually prayed two different psalms. He referred to two different psalms. Uh, one of them is Psalm 22, um, uh, when he said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me when he was on the cross? And you can read through that psalm and think of the prophetic significance. It's quite outstanding. 
It's amazing to think that that prayer uh, was written hundreds of years earlier, but described exactly what Jesus was encountering, what he was experiencing right there as he was crucified. Uh, There's another one as well. Maybe that's a little bit of homework. What other psalm did Jesus share? Uh, Did he speak out in prayer uh, from the cross? Um, But just for now, taking a step back from the details, just consider this, that at his most painful moment, Jesus used words of prayer that had already been given to him in here. And in that sense, it's the same for us. When we are in times of great challenge and difficulty in our own lives, the Bible provides us with words to pray. Uh, I think that is worth uh, paying attention to. Another scripture we could turn to is actually Romans uh, chapter 8, where Paul writes about God's amazing love. Now, these are uh, almost like possibly favourite verses. I I, I don't think a month goes by without somebody uh, reading these or praying these out in one of our uh, meetings uh, together. So just as a reminder, uh, Romans chapter 8, verse 35. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ, Paul writes? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? He asks a question. Now, if you're like me, I have to confess, I've probably read these verses in this way. It sounds triumphant, sounds wonderful, sounds glorious. And it is. Nothing can separate us from the love of God. Um, That's for us in Christ. But with what comes next in verse 36, I kind of feel that I've read that sometimes as though, you know, like a little bug has just flown into my windscreen and made a mess. And now I quickly want to wipe it aside uh, before moving on. Because what Paul says is this, as it is written, for your sake, we face death all day long. We're considered as sheep to be slaughtered. And that's the part that I might typically just want to kind of wipe away. Hmm, What's Paul talking about there? And we get back to the more triumphant language of verse 37. No, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us and so on. Are you a bit like me? Have you kind of learned to read that passage and think verse 36, what's it doing there? Well, it's another psalm of lament. And if you turn to that psalm, Psalm 44, you'll see, ah, I think that is where Paul learned about the unfailing love of God. Um, He'd experienced trouble. He'd experienced hardship, persecution, famine and nakedness and danger. He'd experienced a lot of those things. And I wonder, is that psalm that helped him to process them and to understand more deeply the love of God? So, yeah, don't treat these as just a side issue. These psalms and other prayers of pain are there to help us to grow and know God and his wonderful love more deeply, more richly, in a way that we we wouldn't know him so closely if we hadn't prayed in this way. So I think there's strong encouragement for us to, uh, to pay attention to these songs, these psalms or prayers of lament. So I have to say as well, I've been quite helped Uh, by starting to read this book here uh, called uh, Dark Clouds, Deep Mercy. I have to confess I've not finished it all, but I've got a reasonable way, uh, a reasonable way through. It's by a guy called Mark, whose surname I can't pronounce and I'm not going to try. Uh, But I've read enough to have been really helped and encouraged by it. And I'm going to borrow some of the things that he points out about these Psalms uh, whilst looking at Psalm 100. And 42. Okay, this is what it's, it means to lament. This is how we lament. First of all, it's turn to God. Make a deliberate choice to turn to God uh, in prayer. Actually, part of the, uh, the forward at the very beginning of this book is written by uh, Joni Erickson Tarder, who uh, I think she's now uh, in her 70s. Um, and when she was still a teenager, she had um, an accident diving into a lake or a pool. Um, and she was paralyzed thereafter. Uh, she just writes a few words um, at the outset. Um, she says, when, I br- uh, when a broken neck ambushed my life and left me a quadriplegic, I felt as though God had smashed me underfoot like a cigarette, 
At night, I would thrash my head on the pillow, hoping to break my neck at a higher level and thereby end my misery. Um, and she, she shares a little bit more uh, about that. But she says, after weeks in bed, I got tired of being depressed and I finally cried out, God, if I can't die, please show me how to live. It was just the prayer God was waiting for. And then she goes on uh, a few paragraphs later. I was amazed to learn, she reflects on spending time in God's word, that God welcomes our laments. I would eventually learn, mainly through lamentations and psalms, that nothing is more freeing than knowing God understands. When we're in pain, God feels the sting in his chest. Our frustrations and questions do not fluster him. He knows all about them. He wrote the book on them. More astoundingly, he invites us to come and air our grievances before him. Do you have some grievances to air? Do you have some questions to ask? Do you have some frustrations with the Lord appropriately to get off your chest? You see, David knows in this situation that he's in, in a cave, being hunted, that he mustn't stay silent before God. He mustn't, as it were, give God the silent treatment. Is that, is that what you're doing? Are you giving God the silent treatment? Maybe accidentally. So that seems to be how it develops, really. Something happens, we're upset, and we don't know what to say. So silence ensues. Would God say that's what's happened to your prayer life? Um, in which case, my, I urge you, turn to God in prayer, use a psalm like this one. Um, that's what David does. You see in verse one, he says, I cry aloud to the Lord. Verse five, I cry to you, Lord. Uh, verse six, listen to my cry. You kind of get the impression of, uh, of what uh, David turning to God in prayer might have sounded like. Um, but you'll notice as well as we go through this psalm, it's very structured. There's a rhythm to it. Uh, it it's not just an aimless rant. He's, he's composed this. this. This has a structure, um, which is something for us to learn from uh, as well. Turn to God in prayer, I urge you. Secondly, um, bring your complaint. Now, it, in the English language, the word complaint might sound a bit strong. It might sound like we'd be telling God off, and we're not doing that, but we are airing a grievance. We are sharing with God what troubles us. Uh, this is what happens here in this psalm. That's what David is doing. He shares what troubles him. Let me just uh, point out a few areas where he does that. So in the beginning of verse three, this is the first thing that troubles him. His spirit is growing faint within him by discouragement uh, and so on. You notice in verse four as well, he says, look, there is no one at my right hand. No one is concerned for me. I have no refuge. No one cares for my life. He's in a cave. He's experiencing massive isolation. That's I suppose that's why I thought I'd read this particular psalm, because many of us might identify with that right now. The cave might be quite comfortable, but it's still really limiting, and it still creates isolation. We're not designed for that. We're designed to be in community. We're designed to be in relationship. We live in a culture that thrusts us into individualism, uh, and, and maybe in some strange way we're being given what we think we want just the space to do my own thing and be my own person. But actually, what we really need is to be in community, is to be in relationship, and that's exactly what's being challenged um, and thwarted at the moment. But look, that's what David is doing. He's bringing his complaints. He's, br he's sharing with the Lord what troubles him. He's lonely. He also speaks of, of, of hidden snares. Uh, people have hidden a snare for me at the end of verse 3, uh, he writes. Later on, he'll refer to this uh, uh, cave that he, he's in as a prison. Uh, it's restrictive. And then he also shares his desperate need. I am in 
desperate need. If you're going to learn to lament, if we're going to learn to lament, we're going to learn this, to bring grievance, to bring complaint, to bring our trouble to to the Lord. Uh, But it's important that we don't stop there. That's not all that's happening here. It's not just uh, uh, a deluge of questions and angst and nothing else. You see, David moves on to make bold requests. That's what lament encourages us to do as well. Make definite, clear requests. Here's, here are the things that David asks God uh, to do. He says, for example, in verse 4, look and see. Look and see the trouble, Lord. Yeah. He's inviting God to pay attention and by implication, do something about it, which he goes on to make more uh, clear when he says in verse 6 in particular, listen, that's what he's asking God to do as well. Listen to my cry, for I am in desperate need. Rescue me, makes another request, from those who pursue me, for they're too strong for me. And then the beginning of verse 7, set me free from my prison. Now this could be that this reference is a time in his life which you can read about in 1 Samuel uh, 22. That's when Dave, uh, David was in a cave. He's also in a cave in, in, in 1 Samuel chapter 24 as well. These times of just being hemmed in and restricted and not knowing the future. His life under threat. But look, he's telling God, he's making definite and bold requests. And you can read the story and find out how those requests, how those prayers were actually answered. But here's something for us to bear in mind as well, is that often in the Bible, these Psalms aren't just necessarily personal. Ones like this read in in that fashion. But elsewhere, it's not just about expressing what I'm going through. Actually, it's about expressing expressing a solidarity with others and saying, this is what we are going through. Even this is what the nation is going through. Maybe you could think of that in in composing your own laments, not just what am I having to cope with, but God, what are you doing in the nation and what's happening in the nation? And it becomes a means of prayer for our nation and making bold requests of God to change the hearts or even the kind of DNA of our nation that's just hardwired to, to resisting God and hardwired to uh, individualism. You know, thinking about who's on the boat. Our society has trained us to think that life is me on my boat doing my thing. Uh, and I kind of worry about this. I, I think for those of us, you know, if you're under 25, you've probably had this like amplified in your life, a world that says, be your own person, do your own thing, be, be a radical, independent individual. You can be who you want, you can think what you want, you can believe what you want, uh, and nothing can stop you uh, from achieving your dreams and desires. And then what, you, know, you go along in that direction, and what happens when well, you bang into life? You bang into trouble, you bang into disappointment, and... At that point, society doesn't really have anything to help you. Well, I say that, praise God for all the heroes who work, especially in areas of of mental health. And your your working life is supporting and encouraging and helping others. Maybe make a slight adjustment to their course. But there's nothing like the Bible for helping us live life. Let's pray. Let's make bold requests. Let's lay it all before the Lord. But don't just stop there either. Don't just make bold requests and make that the conclusion of your prayer. See, in this lament, it goes through this rhythm and it has this other note. And this is really important for us to to consider as well before we close. Uh, The fourth thing is choose to trust. Choose to trust God. God. That might mean active patience in an area of life that doesn't actually seem like changing. 
I, if we could have a conversation with Joni Erickson Tada, I'm sure she could tell us the ways in which God has answered her prayers and helped her and come to her aid. And she would still be in a wheelchair. There will be things about life that haven't, hasn't changed and yet she's known God. So let's turn in God, turn to God and choose to trust. See how David does that here in verse three towards the end. Uh, or even in the middle, he said, when my spirit grows faint within me, it is you who watch over my way. I've been getting faint. I've been getting concerned and depressed, but you've been watching over my path. You've been with me, Lord. I can see that is in effect of what he's, he's saying. He's complaining that no one cares about him, but he says in verse five, I cry to you, Lord. I say, you are my refuge, my portion in the land of the living. He's choosing to trust. Um, and then he went, when he gets into verse seven as well, he makes that bold request. Set me free from my prison that I may praise your name. Then the righteous will gather about me because of your goodness to me. He's kind of, he's kind of saying, this will bring about good fruit. Do something, God. I trust you for the future. I trust you for how this is going to unfold. I trust that you will bring about goodness, not just for my benefit, but for other people's as well. Let's, let's learn to pray. Let's keep praying. If you've been grinding to a halt, then come and turn to the Lord and ask him to help you to change tack a little bit, to use lament, to use the Psalms, to deepen and enrich our prayer life. That is my encouragement for this, for this time, for this week, and for however the Lord would have us in this season. Maybe he is using this time to, to deepen and to broaden, as it were, our, our prayer life, the, our repertoire, our ways of engaging with God. Amen.